what I wanted to do is recognize Ted tonight because uh, Ted is with uh, our juvenile detention center and they passed with flying colors all of their um, requirements from the state of Texas and uh, I'm going to give you a few minutes to tell us all about that and and what you've done. Uh, once a year the state comes out looks at uh, all our standards that we're required to go by uh, as far as the facility goes. We looked at in three different areas. One is on the pre-adjudication side which is our detention side. One is on the post-adjudicated side which are the kids that have excuse me, <clears throat> been to court and have actually been sentenced to uh, the facility for a longer period of time. The last is, all, is a uh, the certification process, uh, hiring, uh, certification, recertification that, we, that the officers go through. Um, on those we had a 95, 96, and 100. Um, last year we, we had the same thing, so we're, we're very proud to be able to, to maintain those numbers. Uh, I don't just give those numbers away anymore. It's pretty hard to pretty hard to get there. So, uh, a lot of people that behind the scenes that do a phenomenal job at the facility. I mean, we we've had our had our knocks here lately, and 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 uh, but what people don't see are the inner workings of what we have going. And, and we have a lot of great things going at that facility. And, and I encourage each and every one of you to, to come out, take a tour of the facility, see what we have going. Uh, those scores are just a very small part of of uh, the overall picture. And, and we're we're proud to get them. Don't get me wrong. We we're very proud to get those scores, but actually working with the kids and getting something done with those kids, uh, whether it be a short-term situation or a long-term situation, that's what we're all about. So we really appreciate the recognition from you guys too. Can you uh, tell us a little bit about the monitoring process, how, what you do during the day plus at night, so just so people will know? The monitoring process yeah. or our day-to-day? -day? Right. But the day-to-day -day, uh, process, basically the kids get up at 530. That's what you're looking for? Yeah. Uh, the kids get up about 5.30 in the morning. Uh, they start their daily routine as far as getting dressed and preparing for, for breakfast that morning. They start cleaning the dorms. Uh, they go to dining, come back, finish up any cleaning, do their hygiene, and they immediately go to school. They're in school uh, 7.45 to 2.45 during the day. Uh, they have a small little break there to eat lunch. Uh, we usually feed everybody within 30 minutes, uh, and then it's back to school. Or some of them have a therapy session to kind of break up the day. Um, 2.45 classes over, 3 o'clock, group therapy starts. They're in group therapy for um, usually till about uh, 4 to 4.30. They break for dining and then they come back. They do the additional groups if they have any. Uh, shower time and process pretty much starts shutting down at that point. Uh, they have a, a small snack for calorie intake. We have to give them a snack in the evening. Uh, finish up any showers, medications, and they're to bed by 8.30 to 9.00. We start the day all over again the next day. Well, what is what are your what does your staff do during the night? Our staff staff does continual checks on kids. So throughout the day, uh, the kids are programming. They're in school doing things like that. Their staff with them. At night, they're actually inside their dorms. Uh, their individual sleeping areas. Uh, staff are on the dorm. They check on the kids periodically uh, and document each one of those checks. Okay, well I wanted everybody to hear what they did and, and what a good job you guys are doing over there with those good scores and everything. There's very few that weren't 100%, so you're to be congratulated. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right, does any citizen have any comments that they would like to make on any agenda item? Okay, if not, we'll move on. Uh, does any commissioner uh, on the consent agenda wish to pull any item off for discussion? Hearing none, Judge, I make a motion to approve A through G. Second. All right, I have a motion made by Commissioner Barry, seconded by Commissioner Hetherington to approve the consent agenda uh, items A through G. Uh, any further discussion? Then all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you. Uh, next item is uh, road subdivisions and plats. We have a public hearing uh, to discuss uh, proposed traffic res re regulations. Uh, Don. If it pleases the court, I'll go ahead and do both of them at the same time. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so. It's 
we, a public hearing is now called for discussion. Okay, so go ahead. It, this is to increase the speed limit on Ports Call Drive from 30 to 40 and increasing the speed limit on Contrary Creek from 144 to its intersection with Blue Bonnet. 40. The, the reason for this to be on the agenda, both these roadways have long hills that they go down and after the request was made we, we sat and assessed it and 90% of the drivers were having to ride their brakes just to stay under the speed limit to go down these roadways. So uh, road operations has found that, that 40 miles per hour would be a safe speed for our prudent drivers here in Hood County and do make that recommendation. Okay, does anyone have any comments about uh, increasing the speed limit on Ports of Call Drive and Con Curry, uh, Creek Road uh, from 30 miles an hour to 40 miles an hour? We have a positive comment from Steve. <laughs> Not this Steve. Steve Foster. <laughs> Steve Foster, yeah. All right, uh, any other comments? All right, uh, then that concludes the public hearing. Um, I will entertain a motion to increase these speed limits. So moved. Second. Mo motion made by Commissioner Simpson, seconded by Commissioner Barry. Is there any further discussion on this item? Then all in favor? Aye. Uh, opposed? Motion carried. Next item is uh, discuss and uh, consider acceptance of dedicated public uh, Humphreys Court Road. Is the public hearing for that too? No, sir. Okay. No, sir. We, we received the request to, for this to be placed on the agenda. All the, on the petition, uh, all of the signatures have been certified. They, uh, it, it meets the requirements that of the 2005 policy that the Commissioner's Court had enacted. Yeah, the, the roadway is located in Precinct 2. It's approximately 2,480 feet long. It's got a variable right-of-way width of 38 foot to 46 foot. But they, do, they have complied with, our, with the policy and road operations recommends acceptance. Okay, is it, you've heard the recommendation? So move. I have a motion Second. by Commissioner Ron, seconded by Commissioner Hetherington. Is there further, further discussion by the, anyone? Then all in favor? Aye. Uh, Opposed? Motion carried. <coughs> Don, you're still up. Set the public hearing. When do you want to yes, set? Yes, sir. We, uh, development Plans would like to set a public hearing to consider and take appropriate action for the replats of lots 1 through 37, phase 2, section 2 of Meander States into Emerald Glen. Staff recommends setting a public hearing for the June 12th Commissioner's Court meeting. So move. Second. A motion made by Commissioner Barry, seconded by Commissioner Hetherington, to set a public hearing to consider and take appropriate action for the replat of lots 137 uh, of Phase 2, Section 2, Meander Estates, uh, into Emerald Glen. Uh, any further discussion? And all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Budget and finance. Stan is not here, so we have Miss Becky Kidd. There are no budget amendments. Very good. <laughs> Very good. Good start, Becky. We'll Maybe invite you back. A little bit. But there are no budget amendments. <laughs> what about consider a, a take appropriate action on paying the bills? With judge commissioners and members of the court, you've all been given advance copies of purchase orders and uh, voucher warrants that are due and payable in this court. The total for adult probation is $868.90. The remaining balance due for all other funds is $340,128.70. The auditor's office respectfully requests payment of all invoices. Move we ratify paying the bills. Second. I have a motion made by Commissioner Hetherington and uh, seconded by Commissioner Rohn to pay the bills. Uh, any further discussion on any of these? <laughs> Been all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Uh, consider and take appropriate action uh, regarding presentation on text 21 from Ross Turner. Ross, do you, I believe you have a... Um, can you go to the third slide for me? One more, one more forward. 
Okay, Text 21 is a transportation advocacy organization. It's a 501c6 nonprofit uh, that works on public policy with regards to mobility and infrastructure improvements. Uh, Text 21 has been around since its creation in 1999. It came into being in 2001 at the annual summit, which is in its 15th year, which is based out of Irving, Texas. Local regional officials like yourselves came together and said that we needed a statewide plan for infrastructure with the, the uh, decrease in budgetary uh, appropriations from TxDOT and from the state legislature when it comes to uh, funding. Um, so Text 21 was born out of that. Uh, Text 21 is a, is a conglomeration of cities and counties uh, that work together for a legislative agenda for transportation policy across the state. It takes into account local regional focus. It also focuses on federal and international policy work. Uh, fourth slide there for me. This is our membership. Uh, City of Granbury is a member of Text 21. Uh, we have about 55 paying members. Uh, we have about eight resource organizations, MPOs, COGs, uh, TTI, Texas Southern University, a uh, handful of others, and we focus on multimodal transportation policy. So we have a heavy focus on service transportation. We focus on freight, commuter, light rail, uh, and, and kind of best practices with all those things as well. So it's multimodal in focus, though we have a heavy focus on service transportation highway infrastructure. Uh, knowing that there's going to be no new roads uh, coming up, we focus a lot on existing infrastructure and the enhancement of that. Uh, next slide. These are kind of a list of our members. You can slide through that, uh, Jackie, couple. Yeah. Let's remember. Um, on this, uh, we have two caucuses, one at the federal level, one at the state level. At the federal level, and we just added Congressman Dan Bourne from Eastern Oklahoma uh, this last week, uh, we have 100% congressional participation from Texas. So all 34 members, both Kay Bailey Hutchison, uh, Senator Cornyn, and all 32 delegates are part of our caucus, and they work with Tex 21. We have a very good reputation for the last decade working with them. Since 2005, we've had 100% participation. At the state level, our organization says 98, but we've added a couple since then. Um, Todd Smith has joined, uh, Bill Zedler has joined, and I talked to uh, Brian Birdwell last week, and he's going to be joining our caucus next week when he returns to, to help us uh, on, the, on the planning. So I know he's excited about working with us. Um, in Arkansas, we have a few initiatives as well there, and as in Oklahoma, uh, but just to let you know, so we're multi-state in focus, even though we have our, our most of our base in Texas. Maybe next slide. And that's just our caucuses, and you can slide through three or four of those slides. And next. And one more. Yeah. So our priorities last last session um, were primarily focusing on the gas tax increase, focused on indexing the gas tax, because since 1991 we've had the same level. So we're talking a lot about trying to find ways to at least meet status quo. Uh, the issue has been inflation has depreciated what the gas tax is doing for us. Uh, we're, we're, we are a donor state to the federal government, so we're working along with U.S. Senator Hutchison to work on that, those issues, and she's brought that up up significantly in her time from I think 80 cents to 93.7 so she's helping us significantly but that's an issue that we're not getting a lot of our money back and it's kind of a broken system that we don't have enough funding to to really uh, take care of our roads much less enhance them so um, DTS is being funded as well as the DMV through the transportation fund. The 20 cents that are coming out, only 9.5 remain in the state. So we're trying to find ways and avenues to uh, end that diversion activity. That's a large piece of legislation that's gonna take a handful of sessions to work on. And I'll quickly go through those, uh, a couple others. DDWI interlock devices, uh, kind of crime prevention and, and issues are a big focus of Tex 21. The company that I work for, Dean International, also has a, a company called the North Texas Crime Commission that it works on, that works with sheriffs and district attorneys and such, and that's a pro bono organization we run, so we kind of have some overlap with that as well. So those are just kind of our, our priorities. Uh, the climate, of course, with the governor uh, giving his um, his de declaration a couple weeks back of no new fees, no new taxes, um, is just saying that there's going to be a lot of coalition-minded organizations trying to come up with strategies to devise ways to fund our infrastructure that's aging. One out of nine bridges are structurally deficient. Uh, the transportation uh, infrastructure that we have right now is maxed out. And uh, you have a map a little bit later on there from the FHWA from Mr. Mendez and the federal government that shows the increase of truck traffic over the next 20 years, and so that's a, that's a highlight of what we're working on. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we also work in a quarterly fashion uh, with our membership. So as members of the organization, we work across the states of Arkansas, Texas, and Oklahoma. Uh, the organization meets, hears from uh, like Chairman 
uh, Chairman Larry Phillips from Sherman, uh, U.S. Congressman Ralph Hall, uh, we also see Harold from uh, Arkansas and others getting the climate on kind of what the, what the temperature is on transportation, infrastructure, funding mechanisms, and the like. So we meet as an organization at a minimum in a quarterly fashion and actually have met so far nine times as an organization through the fiscal year. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, those are regional meetings, so we have both statewide meetings, uh, multi-state meetings. We also have regional meetings. The city of Granbury hosted two years ago uh, a meeting that talked about that. I think a handful of commissioners were there uh, to talk about toll road pass-through and some other things like that. Uh, so we have a regional focus as well in, in our meetings. So those are not part of our contract, but we ho host those to get perspectives for our state and regional committee. Uh, next slide, please. All uh, we work with TxDOT in a quarterly fashion with the executive office. Uh, we'll be meeting with Director Phil Wilson for the third time on June 8th. Uh, we met with him 19 days into his tenure here, uh, which shows the positive relationship that we have with TxDOT's executive director and his staff. Uh, the last time we met with him was March 16th. I had a very positive meeting with him. He's excited about working with Tex21 and working about what we're trying to do. Um, next slide, please, Jackie. Very briefly, our standing committees were broken down for, for focus. The membership breaks down into committee structures. There's a federal structure, of course, to talk about FAA, to talk about, of course, the federal reauthorization bill, which is kind of stagnant and kind of in a um, short-term reauthorization right now. State regional committees focus on a variety of multimodal infrastructure policies. Our special topics committee focuses on Panama Canal expansion, the right amendment, and talks about creative project financing, such as PPPs, CDAs, uh, and a handful of other mechanisms. Uh, next slide. So why don't you go ahead and go through the next couple, three, two, three slides, and we'll go to the... Um, Where's the advantage? Yeah, keep going through there. That's our corridor initiatives that we're focusing on with some of our members. Uh, next slide. And two more. So this is the traffic count, uh, kind of uh, focused from 2007, uh, from the Federal Administration Planning Department. Uh, one slide ahead. This is what it looks like in 2040. Uh, with truck traffic beating down the roads, we don't have a plan right now, we don't have the funding right now. Uh, Joe Pickett from El Paso, when he was the chairman of the 81st session, said out of the $8 billion that Texas has, $5 billion goes to debt, and $3 million goes to planned roads. So there's no new money. And so with the increase in truck traffic, there's really no ways to understand how we're gonna come up with that. So this type of coalition devises strategies for that. Uh, next slide. The trunk tracking system is uh, an approved system uh, by the legislature back in 1998. And this is just an idea. This is not something that Tex 21 advocates, but it's an idea to kick around at the state regional level to talk about mobility uh, of trucking. And so there is a corridor that was, that was administered by the TTC across Texas. That fund has not been, has not been uh, um, helped since 2002. So Tex 21 would come up with ideas of how to focus on these type of regional corridors or for funding and construction. Uh, next slide. And very briefly, uh, I'll talk to you about the new members. I've talked about our meetings. We're statewide. We have meetings in Allen, Sherman, Texas. We have a meeting in Far, Texas, which is by Edinburgh. I uh, have an upcoming meeting next month in Mansfield uh, and have another meeting in August in Irving. Uh, new members for our, our uh, organization this fiscal year include 22 members. Uh, so the need for the coalition is very vital for a lot of people uh, and, and we're growing as well. We have about 55, 60 members uh, that, are, that are paying dues uh, for our organization. Next can slide. You, how many many counties do you have? We have 12 so far, sir. 12 counties. Yeah, uh, Tarrant, Dallas, uh, Collin, Tyler, uh, let's see, um, Rockwall, Grayson County, Wise County, and a handful of others. We're hoping with we, as we grow the county voice, uh, that, that's what we're trying to push, uh, to grow more of a county perspective as well. Um, one more slide, Jackie. And here's, here's the information regarding membership. Again, it's a 501c6, thus we have, uh, we have political activity in our nonprofit organization. Uh, voting equity is a major kind of earmark in, in the way of, of our, 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 what we'd like to boast about is because the, the organization is dues and the dues are different for different populations based upon 2000 census levels, the voting is equal. And uh, we do that through our committee structures, our ad hoc committees. We normally meet on conference calls monthly. We talk at regional meetings and at quarterly meetings. Uh, and through that, uh, vote and voice are equal. And so the vote of the city of Rome and Wise County and Decatur is equal to that of the city of Dallas uh, at 1.2 million. So that's a unique thing that many, many members love and join. 
important for those reasons. Um, the dues, again, for, for the county, normally uh, on the system it's based upon 25000 to 49000 for the county, so it'd be $4,200 for membership, uh, but the executive committee has allowed us with the fiscal year being halfway through to prorate those dues for 2125 uh, for the county to join our organization. And Dean International Incorporated is a company that I work for. Mr. David Dean is our president CEO. He's a former secretary of state. Uh, he was the uh, general counsel for Dolph Briscoe and Bill Clements back in the 80s. And that is, uh, that's the man who, who leads our organization. So that's our presentation and um, I'm open for any questions. Anyone questions? Where would they meet? Would we, if we were in that, where, where would the meeting be? The meetings would be, they're actually member, kind of member discussed and uh, uh, the city of Mansfield just offered to say we'd like to do a meeting. It doesn't cost anything for the city or, or the counties to do those. Uh, the organization funds those, funds the lunches, organizes the agendas, puts together the speakers, disseminates all the communication materials and does the follow up and reports. Uh, so the membership, uh, when, the, when the county joins, they have three voting representatives, one primary, a secondary and an administrative, and, uh, but anybody from anybody from the county can join and participate in our organization at any time. And again, we've had nine meetings so far in about six months, so we're, we're kind of all over the place. But uh, The yes, meetings sir. are pretty good. You just set them at any time, there's no sir. Yeah, we'll, we'll set them in a quarterly way, uh, kind of a, a base a base amount of meetings we'll have is four, um, Commissioner. But we'll have a lot of regional meetings too to talk about kind of climate for state and, and kind of county views to put together that legislative package. And then we meet in a monthly way during the session uh, in Austin as an organization. So we'll go down there about six times uh, as an organization to advocate that legis legislative package. Yes, sir. How long do these meetings usually last? Uh, sorry, what, Commissioner? How long do these meetings usually last? Last, sir? Um, well, we, we try to make it the best use of time, so we try to make it two hours to three hours. Yes, sir. How's your voting? How does your I'm sorry. How does your voting uh, rights go? If you're if you're a county, you get vote like a city or what? Yes, it's uh, they're all all equal. So even though the dues are different, the county and city votes are all equal. So uh, we talk about those things in our ad hoc committees and those standing committees that I showed you, and uh, the votings are, are the same. And, and the secondary member would vote um, in case the primary member was absent as proxy. And the same would be for the administrative representative. Um, we we normally are pretty collegial in how we work together. Uh, it's an organization that that kind of defies gravity in a lot of ways. It's been around for 11 years and uh, we find six to ten policy initiatives that everyone agrees upon and we move those forward. <clears throat> Sir. I kind of like it because there's 254 counties and only 12 in your organization, yes, so it would kind of give us a leg up on that. Yes, Judge. Um, it, it really is a, a unique thing. Uh, we have a legislative uh, caucus staff as well that we go down. So we not only work with the, the caucus members themselves, but we update and brief the staff in a quarterly way. When we go to Austin to meet with Mr. F Phil Wilson, we also do a briefing about 10 to 12 different presentations that are done by the members that we'll write up and we'll discuss and talk about that will be done by the membership that will update the staffers, the chief of staff the legislative aides on transportation policy issues. How, how often is the head of TxDOT there? He's there actually with us every quarter. And so we go with him in a quarterly fashion. We're actually going to see him in three weeks again on June 8th on a Friday. Uh, he's made himself available to us. For a time, we didn't have some meetings with uh, Director Signs when he was a part of the organization. But with Mr. Wilson, like I said, 19 days into the organization's uh, his tenure, he met with us and shows the really uh, positive interaction that we have with TxDOT's executive director. Where's that meeting going to be held at? It will be in Austin, sir, at their Riverside offices. And uh, the way we do it is we'll have 10 to 15 members go with us, along with myself and a couple other consultants, and uh, when meetings, uh, when members cannot attend, we call and ask for issues to be brought up and to be presented on your behalf, uh, because we know travel is difficult uh, quite a bit for, for elected officials. So, For vehicles or trucks. Come. Judge, I would be prepared to make a motion to table this issue for further discussion. Uh, number one, the dues is not in this year's budget, and secondly, I'm not prepared to make any kind of decision on a five-minute PowerPoint presentation. I agree. I have a motion made by Commissioner Simpson, seconded by Commissioner Hetherington, to table this uh, to, so we can get some more uh, questions answered and mm -hmm. get back with you. So, um, any further discussion on this? All right, 
then all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you, Commissioners. Thanks, Steve. All right. I, item number two on miscellaneous is consider and discuss a public hearing regarding the flood zone on Highway 144 South at Rough Creek. Uh, Commissioner? Uh, just as a matter of uh, information, <clears throat> what this involves is um, a discovery through having had through a question being raised and then having had uh, the area resurveyed to check the FEMA numbers that were published, I believe, during the last um, census 10 years ago, uh, only to find that FEMA has made a horrendous error in this area regarding elevation. According to the FEMA numbers, if the floodplain level would reach the bottom of the currently identified FEMA level, the water would be 21 feet above the 144 bridge. Um, what question that raised in my mind and the mind of others is how many people around that area of the lake have been paying flood insurance as a requirement of their bank or their mortgage institution that perhaps would not have to have been paying for flood insurance. Um, I don't know where it's going to go or where it's going to end up, but I thought it was our duty after discovering the error to um, bring it up publicly and to um, show the discussion and we and there is a way we have been assured with the uh, data that we have to force FEMA to correct these numbers. And, uh, I think that's what hopefully the eventual outcome will be. Well, let me give you an example. One guy's uh, flood insurance was $40,000 a year on his house. And uh, he just, I can't afford it. So consequently, he's locked in. I mean, he can't sell his house. He can't, uh, another guy's 19000 There's several out there in that, in that same example. And, uh, and it's all because FEMA did their elevations wrong um, and but you can't just say hey look at this it's not right you can't you have to go through a process and so that's what we're talking about doing and the process is um, um, short but detailed but it takes probably six months to get the change made by FEMA and uh, they have no choice on this one but to make it in our favor because the numbers don't lie. They have the option of coming out and checking the surveying numbers and they'll find that they are correct. Uh, they've been done twice. They've been verified by an independent one besides that. So it's, um, they did make a mistake and um, I think it's I think it's our responsibility to call attention to it. And, and we asked that uh, the hydrologist that question: uh, What if we go through this process, pay the money to have this done, and uh, what's what's the likelihood that they'll change? He said, "Oh, 100 percent." He said, "100 percent," because they're. I mean, it, it, well, I don't want to mention the word and give somebody an idea, but they're looking at the potential for a massive class action lawsuit. If they, yeah. Right. And a county really has no responsibility here because we don't do the surveying and we don't determine what FEMA's floodplains are and we don't determine the mortgage laws. But I think it is our responsibility to call a mistake to the attention of the public and, um, and get it corrected. So do you want to set a public hearing for June 12th on this end or when do you want to set it? Logically that's when it would be, but I won't be here June 12th. I don't know if it's necessary that I am because the, that is going to be presented by the hydrologist, and I, I mean I'm not I have no input to the data. Did, so. did you say? Uh, just so I understand you in this acoustic chamber. Did you say this year's maps or the 20 or 2000 maps are wrong? Both. James, I don't want to put you on the spot, but BRA and FEMA did those together, and we just now got them two years after we were supposed to get them. Do you know anything about this? I know you've been out with other issues. And I, just after coming back after a couple weeks off, I was just made aware of it. The, the area that they're referring to is where Rough Creek uh, actually intersects the, the area there near the at Lake Granbury near the 144 bridge. That that is an area that's been in question f for as long as I've been in this position as floodplain administrator. Um, if there's uh, H and H, if there's an H and H study out there, as Dick said, that could be submitted to FEMA, 
typically they will change that area. Right now it is, there's always been a question because over a, a very short distance, uh, I, I refer to it as the peninsula that sticks out there near the 144 bridge. Uh, from, from the very tip of that back up to uh, probably a quarter of a mile, there's that increase between 21 to 27 feet in, in height. And Steve, uh, what happened on two of the studies is they simply took the, is it five or six readings, the lines, there's five or six lines that cross at the far end of the peninsula, and when they took the new ones, they transposed one elevation on the old lines, is what they did. It looks like it shifted. It, like they shifted it the, the 250 yards that he's talking about. <clears throat> yeah, there's, so there's, the mistake has been repeated, is my point, is his point, as long as he's been around. The mistake's been repeated and simply accepted from FEMA. It, it has yeah, we caused public, some... We had public hearings here, and half is who did the study, because BRA split that fund with FEMA. We tried to get them to do tributaries, mm -hmm. all these Rucker Creeks and all these little creeks, and they refused to do it. So you're telling me that even on the new maps, they're wrong? Yeah. So I say I, I think it's it's up to us to have the public hearing and and um, give the court the option to vote upon spending what it will cost us to make the correction and force FEMA to change it. The the only recommendation that I that I might give you and it's only a recommendation is uh, if it is a third party engineer. Um, I don't know what our engineers would charge to maybe review that data. I know that Wilson Company. Uh, has experience in H and H studies just to verify the information before you spend the money. Just a thought. That's that's why I want the hearing, James, because part of the hearing will be bringing out uh, uh, what the cost involved would be too. Yeah, but what about BRA? They spent state money. I mean, why wouldn't the BRA be in interested? Because it was a study for them as much as it was FEMA. Maybe they should be brought into the hearing. I believe they should. Well, I mean, right here in this room before we renovated. That's how long ago it's been. We were still meeting here, but FEMA had all these maps over here laid out on the tables. Yeah, that's true. But BRA was looking for partners to do tributaries. Yeah. So BRA spent state money as well as FEMA, and we actually spent a, a portion of money to try to get some tributaries done. It looks like it was just copied, though, Steve. That's what it does. It looks like a copying error, and then it got published. And Yeah. Okay. That's what he showed us. So you want to set a public hearing for... Uh, June the 12th, then, to hear this, even though you're not going to be here, Commissioner? Yeah, I, I don't really have. I mean, we can have the hydrologist here. and. It doesn't those matter. People. I have no technical input to it. All right, I'll accept a motion. Uh, you want to make a motion? So moved. Uh, have a motion made by Commissioner Rohn. Do I have a second? To I accept that. Mike uh, Simpson uh, seconded to uh, have a public hearing on regarding the flood zone on Highway 144 at Rough Creek. Any further discussion? And all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Consider and take appropriate action to approve recommending to Texas controller uh, of unclaimed. What, uh, what this is is a, um, this, uh, we have unclaimed funds that are laying there uh, that's been unclaimed from people who put up deposits for your cooperatives like uh, Tri-County and uh, all the all the uh, all utilities in the all, county. All 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 of them. But I was before Stan took his trip. He was telling me that he thought part of this money is what we were using for. We were planning on using for the uh, study for the Y. That's right. About and six thousand so dollars. We're going until he gets back and tells us where we're at. We need to table this. I move. I move. We table this till Stan gets back and clues us in on where we're at on this. Second. Okay. I have a motion made by Commissioner Hetherington, seconded by Commissioner uh, Barry to table this uh, until we get more detailed knowledge on exactly uh, what what, we've what the 381 part is. Any further discussion? And all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Consider and take appropriate action regarding Lake Granbury Medical Center lease. Uh, we we uh, uh, there were a couple of items on this lease that were. Uh, where the uh, hospital wanted us to indemnify 
them against certain things in a contract, and the state of Texas will not let us do that. It is against the law for the county to indemnify another a company. So, and the, uh, we sent that back to the Lake Granbury Medical Center, and they went back to the corporate office. So, I want to make a motion that we table this till uh, next. <laughs> I have a motion made by Cockrum and seconded by Commissioner Hetherington to table uh, the lease for the Lake Grand Mary Medical Center with Hood County. Any further discussion? And all in favor? Aye. Aye. The motion carried. Consider a uh, resolution authorizing uh, if, uh, Filing of a project application with the North Central Texas Council of Governments and the Regional Solid Waste Program uh, local implementation project. Take appropriate action. How are you doing, James? Thank you. Judge, commissioners, what you have before you is a, a rough draft, uh, the very beginning stage of the proposed project description uh, <clears throat> that we would submit to COG if the court decides to allow me to, uh, and my department, to go ahead and make application to the Council of Governments uh, to hopefully get grant funds that are available uh, to fund uh, a cardboard baler, a forklift, and a building to cover the baler itself. To, and in doing so, hopefully that would offset some of the costs that the county is currently experiencing with uh, just getting rid of that waste. Currently, a cardboard is, is put in a, a commingled recycling bin and we're actually paying to get rid of that. What I'm hoping to do, if we can get this money and implement this project, is to actually bail that cardboard and then sell it to a recycling company and make some money off of it. Where's this building going to be, James? Well, it would, it would cover about half of a concrete slab that sits there next to our attendant building at the CCS that is already in place that uh, was actually funded with the last grant cycle. Do we have any uh, matching part of this? Uh, at this point, no. Well, it's not required. Uh, things that, that I'm going to uh, include in the grant, I'm going to actually include verbiage that says that the county's providing the property along with the existing infrastructure, if you will, the concrete slab, the three-phase power, things of that sort. What you're asking for us to do is give you the authority to go ahead and apply for the grant? Yes, by approving uh, the resolution, it, it gives me the authority to go ahead and, and submit the application. So moved. And I'll second it, but actually when he came over and asked, this is a second ground and some money's left over, so he thinks we have a good chance of getting this because not all the money was spoken for. So uh, right now, we could bail the cardboard. We've had some businesses have called and asked about cardboard to take cardboard, so that's why he brought it over and, uh, and asked for it. It's a small amount of, for the grant and it's a, uh, as he said, we don't have to put anything up. We can use our land and property as our portion, so I'll second that. All right, we have a motion made by Commissioner Hetherton, seconded by Commissioner Barry, to uh, approve the resolution authorizing the filing of a project application with North Central Texas Council of Governments for a regional uh, solid waste pro program. That's a good idea. Uh, any further discussion? And all in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you. All right. Now, the next item on the agenda is April Mitchell, I believe. Uh, consider ARDS funds uh, uh, presentation from Mission Granbury for CASA. Yes, sir. Thank you. Good evening, Judge and Commissioners. Appreciate your time tonight. Um, my name is April Mitchell, and I'm the Executive Director for Mission Granbury a crisis and victim services organization for you that, that do not know uh, we do have a financial assistance program and three victim services program one of which is uh, the CASA program which is a child abuse advocacy program that I'd like to talk to you about tonight my primary reason tonight to um, come before you is to discuss a fund that Hood County currently has um, called the ADRS fund and I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the distribution of those funds and the allocation uh, back to the community. Um, 
initially uh, this fund was set up by the legislature in 1999 and uh, according to Bob Blessing uh, with the Hood County he states that we have approximately 100,000 in this fund and the way in which we we get this fund is uh, $15 of every civil court case that's uh, heard in Hood County is set aside in this fund and that's accumulated uh, since that time about 100,000. Um, what I would like to propose tonight is a consideration of that funding for Mission Granbury to um, increase some of its services to the CASA and the, the children in this county that are abused. Um, at this time we have about a, we well as of about 30 days ago we had about 111 cases, child abuse cases. We have about 29 CASAs and um, we are currently at about an 89, um, we have 89 children that are um, overseen by CASA. To give you an idea of what a CASA does, a CASA um, is a specially trained advocate that meets with the ch a child that's been placed in CPS custody. And what they do is they get to know the child, they get to know the parents of the child, and they get to know uh, the foster parents. And what their role is in this process is to advocate to the court system on behalf of that child. In light of the fact that most uh, CPS workers have approximately 40 to 90 case, cases on their caseload, um, and the complexities of these children, uh, Texas CASA has said it that, um, that they prefer that a child have one cost per child. And um, what I would like to see is if you all would consider an allocation of funding to Mission Granbury from this fund so that possibly we could uh, increase our FTEs or full-time employees in that uh, program to about one and a half more FTEs. Um, what that would help us do is recruit and train new CASAs. We're getting ready to have a class. We have about four CASAs that are going to be trained. Currently we have about 20 children that are uh, awaiting uh, CPS placement with a CASA. Uh, and the reason that we don't have them placed is because we, we're just maxed out with our um, CASAs and the availability. Um, I have brought with me tonight, um, should you have any questions, uh, a gentleman, uh, Jeff Lerner, he's an attorney who is, um, has expertise in these types of funds. If you have any questions, uh, I would be happy to answer them. Um, well, I would certainly advocate supporting the idea. I think we are obligated to wait until we can talk to Mr. Blessing and determine a couple things. Number one, exactly what's in that fund and what the mechanism is that continues to support it since this wouldn't be a one-time investment. Yes, sir. Well, I, I agree with you. I'm looking at both uh, the auditor's office and the treasurer's office, and I don't. Neither one of them have seen the letter we've seen, so we're not against today for what you're wanting to do. But I want to make sure there's that kind of funds, or all the future funds, can go that direction. But I know Becky made eye contact, and Kathy made eye contact, and I, I just want to make sure that we have funds yes, sir. readily available, or what you're trying to do. The sustainability would be my question, uh, and, and certainly not, not questioning the idea. But from a sustainability standpoint, if that fund currently has a hundred thousand, then how long did it take to get there, and yes, what is the annualized uh, potential for that fund as far as growth and deposit is concerned, regarding the number of cases that qualify for applying to it? If uh, if that number is more like uh, ten thousand, then we have a problem with doing this more than once. Uh, I'd like to see something set up to where a percentage of that fund, depending on its size, would continually go to support that effort. But okay. until we know what those numbers are, we'd be guessing it'd be foolish to commit to it. How much is one and a half FTEs? What's that annually? Uh, that would be approximately about $60,000, I would say, uh, just to give you an estimate. Uh, and I was remiss to say just um, you see in the overview that you have kind of what the section and the, the code is, and I'd like to say it for the attendees, if you don't mind, uh, that according to the Texas Civil Practice and Remedies Code, uh, the section 152.004, the Texas Civil Practice and Remedies Code, permits the allocation of these funds, and, and it's been used in a couple of other 
other counties for these purposes, and so I just um, do appreciate your consideration. And um, Dan Coates, who's the president of our board, is also here uh, in attendance, and we do appreciate you all listening to us. I think everybody is definitely in favor of it. We just need uh, just a tad more information. Um. Yeah, I, again, sustainability would be my, my concern. If by law, indeed, 152004 tells us that's all it can be used for, then we'll certainly move to do that. But it still needs to be managed in some proper fashion because it will become part of a, of a rec law required budgeting process. It's the same thing that Angel Krasminski did when yeah. Child Advocacy Center found, you know, the there's a line item that we can do for them as well. But we just need to run it by our county attorney yes. and also make sure that we know where the line item is and the funds are and go forward with it so and once that's done by the way then it can become uh, annually become a standard part of the budget that is recognizable by everyone and we'll have regularly quarterly reports on what that fund looks like perfect that would be great thank you right. judge I make a motion we table this until the next court second I have a motion made by Commissioner Barry seconded by Commissioner Rohn to table this until we get further information uh, any further discussion and all in favor Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you, April. Thank you all. Thank you very much, April. Consider and take appropriate action to allow the information technology to initiate internet connectivity with charter business services and run service parallel with, concurrent, with current AT&T internet services. Thank you, Judge. That's quite an entrance on that one, isn't it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> sorry about, I'm sorry about that. No. I, <laughs> uh, Judge Commissioners, this is concerning our service with Charter that we've been working on turning up. Um, we've already turned up a couple of our wide area network sites across the county and this one has to do with our internet service. We're ready to turn that up and Charter has been very good to uh, cooperate with us to allow us to evaluate and test the internet circuit, make sure that it works for both internet traffic that we have as well as our uh, virtual private network that we use for our sheriff's office and other offices that have remote connectivity to the county, uh, primarily for Spillman access is one of those. Um, I'm asking for your permission tonight to go ahead and run these two services parallel while we perform the transition. Uh, I believe that we can uh, successfully accomplish this within 40 to 45 days. I have asked for a 60-day window just if there is any outside chance that we run into something that we need a few extra days to uh, work with that on. And long term this is going to be something that's going to be very good for the county and a positive move. Um, after we complete the transition I'm going to be requesting for permission to terminate that contract with AT&T as uh, that contract has come due and I'd like to go ahead and make that uh, permanent at that time. Money in your budget to run these simultaneously? There's budget there and I believe Commissioner that this particular uh, one comes out of our budget in IT. Um, we do have some of our lines that come out of non-departmental but I believe that this one does come out. The price that we pay for AT&T at this time is uh, $16.79 a month. Um, oh, let me correct something on that. We are budgeted for our current service, Commissioner Barry, and, and uh, I don't, uh, I'm don't, not really sure if we have enough funds in there to cover this two months of service at 728 each. I believe we do but I cannot answer that for certain. I have spoken with Stan about this to make sure if there was available funding in non-departmental for such that would uh, you know, work from telecommunications standpoint. Um, at that time, he told me that that was there. I told him what I wanted, what we were shooting to do for this. Um, this is just a part of that stuff we've already approved and talked about, right? It is, it is, Judge. And, uh, and it was just something that we, this particular one kind of demands that we run these parallel just while we make the transition so there's no interruption in service for our Spillman users and uh, other current users that access that system. Okay. The total cost for this, I'm sorry, the total cost for this, I'm sorry, Commissioner, but the total cost for this is uh, going to be $1,400 for those two months. Motion to approve. Second. Second. Motion made by Commissioner Bear, seconded by Commissioner Hetherington. Uh, 
Um, is there any further discussion? Then all in favor? Uh, I, I have opposed? A, I have an announcement. Oh. Uh, this afternoon they had a pre-construction meeting at Erath County at TxDOT and uh, the mayor was here and he's walked out. But on Friday, May the 18th at 2.30, there'll be a groundbreaking for Loop 567 and it'll be down by the boat ramp on the Pearl Street end. Uh, the meeting, what came out of the meeting today is that it'll take 287 days to complete the loop and it'll be around March of 2013. But the uh, contractor, the says they will be able to do it in 220 days, so they think they'll be through the 1st of January of 2013. But there is a groundbreaking on uh, May 18th at 2.30. Uh, the text dot and the Chamber of Commerce is handling that. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, nothing else, we're adjourned. It's 8, wait a minute, 7.51.